poor. They were not steel-reinforced concrete structures. The concrete was used only as a flooring material. Somehow, virtually all the beams broke apart into short sections. Only a few steel beams that were along the outside of the tower remained connected together, such as these. Here are two steel columns that are still connected together by steel plates. These columns were along the outside of the tower. A closer view of the rubble makes it look as if the towers were put through a giant shredding machine. What happened to all of the office furniture? Where are the elevators? And what about the staircases? The concrete, office furniture, and people disintegrated into such small pieces that the firefighters were scooping them up with buckets. Only the largest pieces of steel survived the collapse. Nearby buildings look as if they were decorated with tinsel. The shiny objects are pieces of the aluminum coverings from the outer columns of the towers. The aluminum coverings were shredded into pieces and blown up to several hundred feet away. In this photo, the sunlight reflects from the pieces of aluminum, making them more visible. How can buildings made of massive steel beams and thick steel plates shred themselves into pieces? This is as ridiculous as an automobile crashing into a wall and then shredding itself into pieces. Buildings and cars are made of a low carbon steel, and this type of steel simply does not behave in this manner. This type of steel bends, it does not shatter into pieces. There should be large, twisted pieces of steel assemblies in this rubble. Perhaps you wonder if the beams in the World Trade Center were thin and delicate, and that fire destroyed the towers because the architects did not make the beams strong enough. However, architects always give a building more strength than it needs in order to provide a margin of safety. The towers withstood storms for decades without any sign that reinforcements were needed. These two rectangular columns ran up the center of the towers. They are usually referred to as core columns because they were in the center of the towers. Each tower had 47 of these core columns. The thickness of the walls in these columns varied from 4 inches thick at the ground to about a quarter inch at the very top of the tower. The columns in this photo are about 2 inches thick, so they were somewhere near the middle of the tower. This photo shows both a rectangular core column and some square exterior columns. There were 236 of these square columns running up the exterior of each tower. Every floor had a network of steel trusses. There were two sets of trusses crisscrossing each other to form a rectangular grid. This diagram shows only one set of trusses. The missing set would be traveling left to right in this diagram. The purple lines along the right side show the orientation and location of the missing trusses. Corrugated steel pans were attached to the top of the trusses. Concrete was poured into these pans to form strong, flat, and fireproof floors. The exterior columns were spaced every meter along the outside of the towers. Windows were placed between the columns. The view in this diagram is looking toward the windows from the core columns. The exterior columns were further strengthened with steel plates. The plates were welded to the columns and then bolted to one another, forming straps around the tower. Since the floors were spaced 12 feet apart, it means each grid of trusses was repeated every 12 feet. The steel straps that wrapped around the tower were also repeated every 12 feet. As you can imagine, that put a lot of steel into these buildings. The empty space in the trusses was used for ceiling tiles, electric lights, air conditioning ducts, and other utilities. It is important to realize that the framework of these towers was 100% steel. By comparison, the building in Oklahoma City that Timothy McVeigh was accused of destroying had a concrete framework with steel reinforcing rods in the concrete. Here is a highly simplified cross-section of one of the towers. It shows one floor of the tower looking down onto the concrete floor. The floor beneath has a slightly different color to make it more apparent that the view is from above. 
There were 47 rectangular columns in the center of the tower, although only four are shown in this diagram. There were 236 exterior columns, although only 16 are shown. These exterior columns were literally on the outside of the building. Many people assume that these towers disintegrated because they were weak, but there is no evidence for such an accusation. Rather, the photos and the descriptions from the people inside the towers prove that these towers were so strong that when the airplanes crashed into them, each tower merely swayed a bit in the opposite direction and then swayed back to their normal position. Both towers then remained motionless. People inside the towers felt them tilt, but the movement was so small that neither photos nor video show the tilting. Obviously, these towers were incredibly strong. According to the engineering websites that have technical data for these towers, the wind force that these towers had to withstand was greater than the force imparted on the towers by the airplanes. In other words, a strong enough wind put more stress on the towers than those airplanes. So what caused these strong buildings to shatter into pieces? The official explanation is that fire did it. Since no fire has ever destroyed a steel structure before, and tests with jet fuel also could not, how could a fire destroy buildings strong enough to handle the crash of a modern, wide-body jet airliner? The only difference between the fires in the towers and conventional office fires is that thousands of gallons of jet fuel had splashed inside the towers. Is jet fuel capable of creating some type of monster fire that destroys steel buildings? Let's take a look. This hole was created by Flight 11 when it crashed into the North Tower. This hole is dark, not brightly colored with flames from a fire. If a fire destroyed these buildings, why are there so few flames? Why are these holes so black? As I describe more thoroughly in the book, the photos provide evidence that the fires were small. This photo is an example. Let's zoom in for a closer look. There is a woman standing in the hole created by the engine of the airplane, and she is alive. On the floor above her and to her left is a man, although he is more difficult to see. Let's zoom in on that woman. She appears to be wearing white pants and has long hair. There is no sign that her clothes or hair have been burned. It appears that there is another woman lying on the floor and looking over the edge, but the photo does not have enough detail to be certain. These women seem to be looking down at the ground. Some reports say that up to 200 people jumped out of the buildings. These women may be wondering if they were jumping into a giant net that the firemen had set up for them. On the floor above these women and to their left is a man standing in a broken window. The Boeing 767 that hit this tower was a large airplane with about 80 tons of metal, people, and luggage. The plane slammed into the tower at over 400 miles per hour. Pieces of the aircraft, flooring, and office furnishings would have flown two or three floors. Anybody in the path of this flying debris would have been killed. The thousands of gallons of jet fuel that sprayed into this area and then caught on fire would have certainly incinerated many people also. The only way anybody could survive this airplane crash was if the flying debris and the fireball did not reach them. Since at least one man and woman survived, and since they were on different floors, they prove that the fires and airplane debris did not extend throughout the entire area of the crash zone. Furthermore, these people walked to the hole from wherever they were at the time of the crash. How could this woman walk through burning jet fuel? How could she survive fires that were so intense that they were allegedly capable of destroying a steel structure? To put that another way, how could a fire destroy a massive steel structure if it was not capable of destroying human life? Obviously, some areas were not soaked with jet fuel, and as we stated before, the fires were not everywhere. This would explain why the holes were so devoid of flames. We can see this woman because she was brave enough to walk to the very edge of the hole, but there may be other people further inside who are staying away from the hole. We can see this man because he is next to a broken window, 
but we cannot see into the windows because of the glare, so it's possible that there are other people near him or behind the glass. What are the chances that only two people survived the airplane crash and fires, and both of them were coincidentally caught in this photo? It would seem that other people also survived, but we cannot see them. They may be trying to get down the stairs. As is explained in more detail in the book, there is no evidence that the fires in these towers were extreme. In fact, the fire in the Meridian Plaza office building in Philadelphia in 1991 was much worse, and that stood firm with little fundamental structural damage. The fire in the South Tower was so small that it did not even spread from one side of the floor to the other. The people who jumped out the windows created the illusion that the fire was so intense that they would rather jump than be burned by the fire. However, the photos do not show fire in the area where these people were jumping. Rather, the photos show lots of smoke. The smoke and the lack of flames are evidence that the fires were not getting enough oxygen. This would cause the plastic and rubber to create toxic fumes. This in turn could cause people to jump to avoid a slow, agonizing death from toxic smoke. The maximum temperature hydrocarbons can reach in the atmosphere is about 1800 degrees Fahrenheit. However, that maximum temperature can be reached only when the hydrocarbons and the air are mixed in perfect proportions. These perfect proportions are reached only in a few controlled situations, such as on a kitchen stove. This produces flames that are clean and blue rather than yellow. Even though stoves reach the maximum possible temperature, they do not melt or shatter into pieces. So how could even lower temperatures cause the towers to disintegrate? Controlled Demolition is a company that demolishes old buildings. They demolished the building in Oklahoma City that Timothy McVeigh was accused of blowing up. They were also hired to clean up the mess at the World Trade Center. They developed a special explosive and technique for using it for demolishing steel structures. They are so proud of this technology that they trademarked its abbreviation. Their British division describes the technology as follows. Our Drex systems segment steel components into pieces matching the lifting capacity of the available moving equipment. In other words, if your trucks can hold pieces of steel up to 24 feet in length, then this company will cause all steel assemblies to break into sections of 24 feet or less. Look at the rubble of the World Trade Center. Is it a coincidence that the entire steel framework of both towers broke into pieces no longer than the trucks that were hauling them away? Only a few of the thousands of pieces had to be cut with torches. Somehow, an off-center fire did exactly what controlled demolition does with their special trademark explosives. NASA and the U.S. Geological Survey created this thermal map of the temperature of the rubble. This map was created five days after the towers were attacked. Obviously, the rubble would be cooler after five days than it was on September 11th. Firefighters sprayed millions of gallons of water on the rubble during those five days, and it also rained. However, one location in the rubble of Building 7, with little fire, was above the melting point of aluminum, and so was one location in the rubble of the South Tower. Not surprisingly, smoke came out of the rubble for months. Peter Tully, president of one company hired to remove the debris, and Mark Loiseau, president of Controlled Demolition, told the American Free Press that steel had melted in the basements of both the towers and also Building 7. These incredible temperatures are evidence that explosives were used. Jet fuel cannot reach these temperatures. The explosives in the basements had to be powerful to break apart the massive steel beams. Explosives create very high temperatures, and the heat had nowhere to go since it was deep underground. According to the scientists who analyzed the seismic data, the North Tower collapsed in about eight seconds. The collapse started at about the 94th floor near this wall.